I invite you to take your Bibles along with me, please. We're going to turn to our uh, text for this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through chapter 2, verse 3. So we're crossing the uh, chapter boundary here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22. We'll begin there. If you're using the church Bible, you'll find that on page 1014. 1014 in the Church Bible. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's Word. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere, brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants. Long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Would you bow with me as we prepare to hear from the Lord? Our Father, we come to you, and as we've just sung, we're asking you to speak. Meet us in this place now. And as we've sought to exalt you through song, through testimony of your work in other places, as we've sought to Fill our minds with your truth. We pray now that you would give us listening ears, ears to hear and hearts to respond to you in genuine faith and repentance. Father, a mere man has no power to do anything apart from the work of your Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would anoint this time for both proclaimer and hearer that Christ would be exalted and your people edified. We pray this through Jesus. Amen. <coughs> well, Kathy, my wife, has a legitimate complaint about me. And uh, this was reinforced yesterday at the marriage seminar. That sometimes I don't listen to what she is saying. So I'll, what happens is I'll ask her a question, and for some reason known only to God alone, I do not fully attend to her response. So sometime later, I'll ask the same question, looking for the same answer, and then she'll remind me that she already told me. Now, I assure you, I don't have Alzheimer's. I, I don't. But I think it's a consequence of the fall. That's just my fallback position. You know, it's original sin. I, I'm not really listening. And I, but I, I know this is true. My problem is that I allow myself to get distracted and I don't give enough attention to the one human voice in this world that I should care to listen to more than any other, right? But I don't. And we all understand this. There are two essential parts of good communication. There's the speaker and the listener. How obvious is that, right? Now, in a covenant relationship, such as marriage, it is so important that we give full attention to the one that we say we love when he or she is speaking. It is so important we do that. Listening has that positive effect of strengthening the relationship. I know that it's not a very loving thing when I don't attend to Kathy's words or, is, or when I behave as if they are not important in the least. Even if in my mind I think her words are important, but my behavior shows otherwise. It is not good for my, our relationship when I do that, and it's not good for me. Now, why am I talking about my marriage? Well, as people of faith, we are in a covenant relationship with God. God has provided a means for that relationship to be strengthened. And it's through Him speaking and us listening. <coughs> Worship. We've been talking about worship in this series that we began a few weeks ago. Worship is that which most glorifies God through our complete satisfaction in Him. That is to say, when how is God most find most glory in, in His people? It's when His people have this 
uh, sense of complete, whole satisfaction in who God is and all that he has accomplished. So for our worship to be all that it should be, when we offer that to God, we must attend to the voice of God. Now, as we look at this Bible passage this morning, my simple aim is to focus on preaching and how it is an essential component of our worship. There's an outline in the worship, or in the bulletin, I'm supposed to call it a bulletin, there's an outline in the bulletin, uh, not worship folder, that was another era. You can follow along, take some notes, there's some blanks to fill in. Let me just start out with what is preaching. What is preaching? Well, we find in our text that the answer is here in verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. You look at that with me, it says, um, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass, the grass withers. There's a comparison here. But the word of the Lord remains forever, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. So taken from that there, our definition of preaching is God speaking. It's God speaking. But it's not just one-sided. It's the people of God listening. It's God speaking and the people of God listening. It's God telling us something, his living and abiding word. And that word ultimately is to our benefit. Now, we might say, well, why does God use men? Why does God use people to speak? And I want to remind you in the Old Testament, we, we dealt with this last week, but that the, the setting in the Old Testament where Moses had led the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're now gathered on Sinai. They're gathered around that mountain. And God tells Moses to get the people ready. You're going to hear from God. The voice of God sounds thunderous to the people of God. It terrifies the people. And they say to Moses, we don't want to do this anymore. You talk to God and tell us what he said. That's my paraphrase. But that's, that's the essence of it. And since that time, God has chosen for men to communicate his word. Uh, this is illustrated in, a, in a, an amazing way in Ezekiel. God has given the prophet Ezekiel this, this vision. And he's, he shows him this valley. You know the story, this valley of dry bones. And what does he tell to Ezekiel? Well, I'll read it there from chapter 37, 3 to 5. And, and, and the Lord asks, and he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. He says, Ezekiel, you tell the bones. Now what happens? Ezekiel prophesies, and they come together. Now, think about this. God could have said, hey, Ezekiel, watch this. I'm going to talk to these bones, and they're going to come to life. And he says, no. He asks them, can these bones live? Ezekiel's going, sure, you know, you're God. Tell the bones what I tell you to tell the bones. And they come together. And there's life. God chooses men to proclaim something that will bring life. Preaching is God speaking to people what he wants them to hear using a human agent in the process. Now this does not speak for the quality of the human agent, okay? This only speaks to the power of the word of God. God has determined to speak his living and abiding word to people through other people, through men. So... We take from this, if we're to understand preaching correctly in the context of worship, both speaker and listener have a responsibility before God. Both preacher and listener, both preacher and listener stand underneath God's word. The preacher standing underneath the word of God must be faithful to speak only God's word. Not his own ideas or his own thoughts or good advice, but only what is God's word. And the listener must also with that, be attentive to the preaching. It is not optional. Now, I understand how this goes. We, we think about preaching while well, we're here. There's John. He's talking away. We've got more important things to do. Maybe you're texting. I'm not just talking to you, youth, even as I look away from you. <laughs> maybe, maybe you. Maybe you've got plans for this afternoon. Maybe you've got to share a note with someone. You know what? What, what he's saying is not so important. So we in that moment, we stand above it. We say, well, there's, it's just a guy. It's just a guy. I don't, I'll listen if I want. I'll take what I can get from it. Just a guy. 
We are all preacher and listener together underneath the word. It is not optional. This isn't about the preacher. And I'm not speaking this this morning so that you give me better attention. I want you to give whoever preaches. And for the next three weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from anybody but me. Okay? Next week, we're away on vacation. The week after that, uh, well, I'll give you the order. It's Davey next week. It's Bobby the week after, again. And then John Arch will be sharing uh, on vocation. All of this in the context of worship. So, whoever is the preacher, they are under the word, and we are together under the word as listeners. So, with that in mind, the content of preaching matters. Now, Jesus, uh, Jesus gave us a picture of how we should understand worship, okay? John chapter 4, you'll recall that this is the exchange between him and the woman at the well. And she tries to divert the conversation away from her own sinfulness and her desperate need for a Savior by talking about religious things. Jesus instructs her there, says to her, The hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit <coughs> And truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. You see, the kind of worship that is acceptable to God has to be informed by the very Word of God. You can feel something in your expression of worship, but if it's lacking truth, then it's not the kind of worship that God seeks. Therefore, it is unacceptable. So this, is, this makes the case for preaching being an essential component of worship. We must worship God in spirit and truth. And that's why preaching is essential. So according to Jesus, content matters. It matters. Now that word preaching, we're talking about that word. That, that <coughs> word is used throughout most of the New Testament, and it simply means proclamation. The preacher is proclaiming something. He's proclaiming something that isn't his own, but it's a message from someone else, okay? And in this case, Christian preaching is a message from God. God has given the preacher a message to communicate. It is God's message. He stands under the word. That the idea here is, uh, you think of the, the town crier, right? The town crier, you know, if you've seen a scene of uh, Elizabethan England, and a message from the king has got to come to the town. So he stands on the corner and he yells, hear ye, hear ye. Here's what the king says. Here's what you need to know. Now that town crier doesn't have the freedom to give his own advice or his own thoughts. He is simply, his job is to simply communicate the message of the king. This is the proclamation. Content matters. It's what the king says needs to be proclaimed. And for the preacher in our context today, content matters. This is all we've got. There isn't going to be anything innovative. There isn't going to be anything new that you haven't read. The message that we get is the message that is here. There's nothing fresh. Okay? So we shouldn't be looking for that. All right, this is purely introduction. So I want to get to uh, this text here, and we'll unpack a little bit of some of the essential uh, aspects of preaching, how we're to understand it in the context of worship. So we've defined it. It's God speaking through men and people listening. Without people listening, right, something's missing in the conversation, right? We need to attend to what God is saying, even through a sinful man who's proclaiming it, because it is the preaching that we're under not the man. You get the difference? Okay. So here we go. Preaching, here's my first, uh, first uh, application point or understanding point, observation point, if you will, from the text. Preaching is how God saves people. That's that first blank. And we know this, right? God created the universe by speaking. In the beginning, God said. He said. Let there be light. <clears throat> Boom. There's light. Let there be animals. Let there be all of this stuff. Boom. It happens. God spoke, and it was. Now, when God is going to save a person, when God is going to bring them into his family to redeem them from their sinfulness, it requires a word. God creates everything through his word, and he creates new life in us through his word. Now, I'll take you to verse 22 of chapter 1 in our text. I, my point here is that preaching is how God saves his people. Verse 22 says, Having purified your souls by the obedience to the truth. A purified soul is someone who is justified before God. 
What we need to stand before God is a purified soul. You need it, I need it. We're not acceptable to God without the purified soul. The way this happens it is through obedience to the truth. Now, verse 23 then explains what that obedience looks like. It says this, since you have been born again. So being born again. How is the person born again? How is, so obedience to the truth sounds like something we're supposed to do, but really what that's referring to is belief. It's trust, it's faith. God has said something, okay. I obey it by, by acknowledging its truthfulness and coming under its authority. That's how I obey it. To obey truth is simply to believe truth and to, to surrender to that truth. So verse 23 explains what that obedience looked like. It called, called being born again. Of what? Not of perishable seed. So the contrast here that we're meant to think of is, you know, when you were born to your mother, you were born of a perishable seed. It's a physical birth that happened. You had nothing to do with it. Your parents planned or not, but you were born. And it all happened without your particular involvement. A spiritual birth happens in the same way, except it's not through a physical seed of a, of a father and a mother coming together. It is the, uh, an imperishable seed of God's word planted. And the planted word of God brings new birth. Of course, that's worked by the Holy Spirit. And this is, uh, you can see this more in John chapter 1, verse 12. Whole part of John chapter 3, the exchange between Jesus and Nicodemus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 talks about being new creations in Christ Jesus. This is a work of God in us to cause us to be made new, to be born again. It's a spiritual birth that happens, and it happens through the proclaimed word of God. Now, verse 25 then goes on to explain what this word is. This word is the good news that was preached to you. This is how you were born again. You heard a word from God preached to you. So, here's the process. You hear the good news preached. The Holy Spirit takes that word and applies it to your heart. And then you respond. Inside you say, yeah, that makes sense. Why do you think it makes sense? Because the Holy Spirit said, hey, this makes sense. And when the Holy Spirit says something to you, you get it. It makes sense. And then when you hear that word, all of a sudden you see your own sinfulness before God. You hear God saying, you're a sinner, you're going to be condemned without me. And we say, yes, yes, that's me. I'm, I'm a condemned sinner, I need something. And the, and, the, and the Spirit brings that word that says, that talks about Jesus. And we hear that word proclaimed to us, the, the word about Jesus, that he went to the cross and he took upon himself all of our sin and our sinfulness. He took that upon himself, dying a vicarious death in our place, so that when we look to him in faith, all of our sin is taken off of our shoulders and put onto Christ, and he died there. And when we hear that word, we say, yes, that's for me. And that's being born again. We get it. That's that imperishable seed, that gospel, that good news that was preached to you. And then your soul, as a result, is purified. God calls you just in his sight, just like he did to Abraham when Abram, uh, God spoke to him. Abraham believed God, and God credited to him, righteousness, just from faith. Because God said something and he believed it. Now the Apostle Paul tells us how essential it is that that word continue to be preached. People's salvation depends upon it. And he asks rhetorically in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You've heard this before. But listen. How then will they, he's talking about unbelievers at this point. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? How's that going to happen, he asks. And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So, here's how this works. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. What's the word of Christ? It's the gospel. Faith comes from hearing the gospel preached to us. God saves through preaching. Now when the content of preaching is as it should be, the good news about Jesus, God uses that to draw people to himself. And this isn't different than anything that Jesus himself had said. Listen to what he says in John chapter 12. Now this is a little obscure. I want you to follow the thinking here, okay? He said this, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. 
And I, when I am lifted, lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to, him, to myself. He said this, the commentary, he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So when Jesus was lifted up in crucifixion, he said he'd draw all people to himself. Now there's a little bit of a word play. It's in the, both in the original and in English. Being lifted up is being raised up on, his, on that Roman cross to die. That's being lifted up. He's on display before people. But we also know that the idea of being lifted up is, is to be exalted. So it follows here. While Jesus died once, he was lifted up once and crucified, he is lifted up every single time the word is preached. And every time he is lifted up and exalted, and the story about his death and his resurrection is told, and the purpose behind it, the purpose behind his death and resurrection is told, some people will come in faith and be born again. Because God determines to work it that way. Because he said, through that <coughs> lifting up, he would draw people to himself. That, it, it just occurred to me, and this isn't in my notes, but you know there's this movie coming out about Jesus? Right, it's, all, it's all in the media, right? Well, Bible stuff's coming back and people are going. And, and I know that people have written articles to say how important this is. Well, this will be great. This will, this will make all the difference. The message about Jesus will get out. You know, it's, it's interesting that what you will see if you do watch that movie, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but don't put your hope in it like it's going to be some great panacea for people to come to faith in droves. Because what they will see is a man being crucified. A crucifixion isn't very unique. All kinds of people were crucified. It's just a death. I mean, it's a brutal one. But what is significant to us as Christians, for those of us who believe, is not the crucifixion, but the cross. And not just the sticks, the wood, but the theology behind it, what that means. You see, we can't tell looking at the screen what it means. We need to be told in the scriptures that when Jesus died, he died in our place. It wasn't that he just died. It's what that means. And then as he hung on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was putting upon him all of our ugly sin. Every vile thing that you have ever done or thought, there it was on Christ, crucified, condemned before the Father. The picture doesn't tell you that. Preaching does. You need to know the content. Well, we all know people who are as yet unbelieving, don't we? And, and maybe some of you here this morning are thinking about what is it going to take for them to believe? What's it going to take? And I'm sure we all think about how are these loved ones going to come to Christ in faith? How is it going to happen? And I know all of us have been tempted to think, well, if we just get a special kind of person to present it, somebody who is uniquely talented and gifted in a particular way, maybe somebody famous, and I remember this as a child, my home church, well, well, we need people to come to Christ, so let's get this famous evangelist and we'll bring him in for revival. Now, I'm not saying that God can't save people through Billy Graham and, and other people who, whose job it is and whose calling it is to proclaim the gospel, but frankly, it's not about the guy. It's about the message. And maybe some of us are tempted to think, well, if, if, we, if we just have the guy speaking, do it in a particular way, leave certain things out and add certain things, and that's not where the power is. Power is not in the technique. The power is in the message. God will save. The Apostle Paul got this, and, and uh, I didn't put this in the notes. Maybe I'm spending too much time on this, but I think it's so important. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, and I take it, from understanding the Apostle Paul's uh, training at the feet of Gamaliel, a famous rabbi, that he, I mean, you could read Romans, and you can read all of his letters, and you can think, this is an extraordinary mind, right? But what does he say in 1 Corinthians 2? He, I'm sure, had, had the ability to, to speak in an eloquent way, but what does he say? He says, and I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with what? With lofty speech or wisdom. I'm not going to try to impress you. I didn't try to impress you. What does he say? For I decided to know nothing among you. Nothing. Nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And why does he say that? That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Everywhere across this nation today, there are people whose faith is resting in the wisdom of a man because he's so good and so clever at proclamation. And I'm not saying to you that people don't come to faith when the guy is amazingly good communicator. But the fact of the matter is, the power is in the message. Well, enough about that. I've got to move on. Here we go. Uh, the second heading. Preaching is how God sanctifies his people. Now, I think we all have this desire. If we belong to Christ, we have this desire for our lives to change, right? You know, I look at my own life and I think, why? Why is there this pride? Why is there this bitterness that comes in? Why am I tempted with lust? Why do I sometimes fall into this ugly stuff? Why? I want it gone. And that's the desire of everyone who is a Christ follower, isn't it? Every one of us who's been blood-bought by Christ, we want the junk gone. My point here is that preaching is how God sanctifies his people. That word sanctify, simply, it's, I know it's a theological word, but we use it to say being set apart. God is working in us to make us less like the world and more like Christ. It's progressive over time. But preaching is how God does that, right? I know that I don't have the power to make myself acceptable to God, and I don't think you do either. I don't have the desire within my flesh to overcome my sinful inclinations, but God has that power. And one of the great benefits of God's word when we listen to it is it, it changes us. It sets us apart. Now our text, I'll prove it from the text. Our text tells us what this looks like. Here's the imperative in chapter 1, verse 22. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Okay, we, we get this. We're supposed to love one another, right? Right? Now, we can do love one another, and, and it look like love one another. We can do certain things for one another, caring for one another, showing kindnesses. We, we can do that stuff, but we can't make our heart pure in the doing it. Because I know that I can do certain things on the external that lack a motivation. I might say, well, I'll do that, and they'll think kindly of me when I'm loving towards them, right? Not a pure heart. But it says, love one another with a pure heart, with pure motive, with a desire for only what is best, right? How do I do that? Well, in chapter 2, verse 1, there's some imperatives, right? This is what we're supposed to do. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he tells us this. Put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Oh, boy. Now, I know I'm not supposed to do these things either, and I, I hope you agree. Doesn't this junk swim around in our hearts? Do, can we really put it away in and of ourselves? And if, if that stuff is decreasing in your life, I trust that it is, it isn't because you had extraordinary willpower to make it happen. I guarantee you that. You're just not extraordinarily gifted at getting rid of junk. Somebody else is to credit for that. Now, we all want to become these kinds of people. And we're told here how this happens. Uh, chapter 2, verse 2, he says this. Long, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. Spiritual milk. Now there's the imagery here, of course, of a little infant feeding off the mother, needing that pure milk to be sustained and grow, right? He says, long for spiritual milk. It's a life-sustaining nutrient that comes from God, our eternal parent. And I know it's a kind of a mothering kind of image, but it's important, right? We need that. Growing up to salvation doesn't mean we're saved by our performance. What it means is that we grow up into the salvation that we have been given. Right? God says, you are righteous in my sight. Well, we all want it that our lives would more and more look righteous, right? We want that. So we're to grow up into this salvation. Peter isn't saying anything new here. The Apostle Paul instructed Timothy. He said this to Timothy, Paul. The, the one who, who had been the, the apostle, planted churches. Now he's bringing Timothy along. He's teaching him to be a shepherd of God's flock in these areas, Ephesus, wherever else he was sent. But he says this to him. And this he says to all who would take on the task of preaching. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And then he tells them how that looks. Reprove. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort. With complete patience. And teaching. 
I had a few conversations this last week. Uh, one of them, I think, was kind of a follow-on to the Friday morning men's coffee. You know, I, I know what this is like. All of us are daily confronted by our failures, aren't we? And it, maybe it's not something we talk about a whole lot. And maybe you see those people who are more mature in the faith, oh, well, they've got it all together. No, they don't. While they may not fall externally, there's that same dump truck full of ugly junk that's swimming around and there are brains. And all of us feel at times, oh, you know, I've taken the step in the right direction, but then there's this other thing that I've just suddenly become aware of. And we hate ourselves for it. And we, we loathe that sin. We know it should be gone. And we feel like, well, I, I just, I can't go to church. I can't be with God's people. I, I'm, I'm such a sinner. What we need, what we need is the word of God to change us. Preaching actually sanctifies us. When we listen to the word of God, it actually has the power to change our affections. It changes what we want. So if you see your life full of junk, listen to the word proclaimed. That's what you need. You can't do it on your own because that's how God will change you. See, the preaching of the word reminds us that Jesus paid for our sins. It reminds us that, that Christ's merit is what will be judged before God on, right? It's his perfection. And that the power to obey in our own lives is, is part of God's grace to us. That's what preaching will tell us. And hearing that, gives us the power to obey because the Holy Spirit takes the word and plants it as we sung in that song, right? Plant this word deep within because it's the word planted within that changes what I want and I always do what I want. But it's true that some people will resist preaching. Paul warned Timothy about this because it's, it's uncomfortable to be confronted with our own sinfulness, isn't it? To be told you're a sinner in need of something beyond yourself is maybe uncomfortable but Paul warned Timothy about this. He said, For the time is coming when people not, will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We naturally want to be told things that we like. Tell me something I want to hear. Now, what Paul is saying here to Timothy irrespective of the content of what's proclaimed. There's, a, there's a, a desire both in the preacher and in the listener that speaks to our motives. We want what we like. It is possible to have the right content in preaching, but still try to appeal to the flesh. This is where it requires discernment, right? Well, I'm running out of time here, so I'm, I'm going to leave that point. Let me just, <laughs> preaching is, is for our sanctification. I want to get to this final one, which really wraps it up in the context of worship. Uh, before I get to that point, uh, we understand this, that access to cheap gas makes us kind of complacent, right? Most of us, a lot of us have really big cars. We just made a decision to downsize one of our vehicles into something that's really fuel efficient. It's small. <laughs> it's not comfortable. <coughs> But what if, what if you didn't have access to the fuel? What if all of that was taken away? What, what if you just couldn't afford to get it? What if there wasn't gas at the gas station? We, we just take so for granted that we get where we're going because of the fuel. It's always there. We always have access to it. And we get it. If we don't have it, we can't go. Here's my third heading. It's simply this. Preaching fuels our worship. If you want to be worshiping God in the way that you should be worshiping God, the way that it is fueled is by the proclamation of God's word. When God's herald heralds out the truth of God's word, it fuels our worship. He says in chapter 2, verse 3, If indeed, he said all that he said, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Tasted. That's experiential, isn't it? If indeed you get it that God is good to you, all of this makes sense, doesn't it? Experiential. It's about our satisfaction. When something is good to us, we say, I like that. 
that satisfies me. And, and I think the psalmist captures that in Psalm 19. Listen, when God's word is proclaimed, we can agree with what the psalmist is saying. If we have been born again, if we understand that God is growing up as, us up in his grace through the proclaimed word, the psalmist says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Listen, he says this in 10. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. When the word of God is proclaimed to us, and you might take this and say, well, that's about reading it. Listen, throughout a lot of history, people didn't read. They just trusted that somebody would tell it to them, right? We have the great benefit of being able to read it ourselves. And I'm not minimizing that. But somehow, some way, God seems to be putting a priority on having this thing told out. Right? This is the power of God's word. When God's word is proclaimed to us, it is everything that we need to be satisfied in God. Are you dissatisfied with God? Listen to God's word proclaimed. Everything that we need to worship God is given to us in his word. And listen, we simply cannot worship God. We will not be satisfied in God if we do not hear from him. Don't be fooled. If we do not hear from God, we will never be satisfied in him. Because we will build our own ideas of what he's like. God says, Jesus said, the Father is looking for worshipers who worship in spirit and truth. Well, let me wrap this up. I think we're not going to do that final song, Bobby. Okay? The question I guess I'd have is, what do you expect when you come to worship? What do you expect? Would you be satisfied if all we did was sing some songs and go home? I hope not. Unless those songs were just full of all kinds of truth content. And I suppose that's possible. But our satisfaction in God, as I've already tried to make the point, is strengthened by the word of God proclaimed to us. And listen, I, I've tried to say this too. This isn't about me as the pastor who primarily is the preacher. When you come to worship, when you come to hear the word of God, is your posture where you are in keeping with the fact that you are hearing from God? Or are you looking at your watch thinking, when's he going to be done? Listen, I know I need to respect time. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue for that. But the question is, are you standing above the word or under it? Are you above it or under it? If you're above it, you're going to go, huh, I don't really like how he said that. I mean, obviously there's, there's discernment, right? If, if the preacher says something that's not true, radar. <laughs> you should have that kind of sense. I'm just simply saying, if we're evaluating what we hear based on whether or not we liked it, or whether it was convenient for me, examine your posture towards it. And we all have to admit, I think, that we all bring expectations to the preaching that God's word doesn't even impose. And it's a sad truth that all, in all kinds of places across the country, across the world, it is a sad truth that many people on a Sunday morning will hear a talk during worship that may be clever and entertaining and well-crafted and engaging and yet lack the essential component of preaching, which is proclamation of what God's truth is. And those people that don't hear it, many will say that was a great sermon because it was cleverly delivered. Preaching means that we take what's in God's word and to the best of our ability as preachers, and we're all flawed, who all, all of us who do this, we're all flawed, to the best of our ability, explaining it so that people can understand and apply it. So often, preaching happens in this way. The preacher has an idea. You know, I want to tell people about such and such. And so they begin to flip through their Bibles. What is going to talk about such and such? I, I heard this, this is some years ago. The pastor was, was 
He wanted to talk about kindness. So he flipped through the Bible and found a part in Ezekiel where it talked about you know, God taking out the heart of stone and giving a heart of flesh and concluding, well, it's about kindness. No, it's not. <laughs> it's about the new birth. <laughs> Took it out of context. That's not what God was saying there. That's what the preacher <coughs> would say. Listen, we all get this wrong, those of us who preach. We all mix it up at times. But the point is, Preaching is simply giving you an exposition, an explanation, a proclamation of what God has already said. There's nothing new. There's nothing innovative. And when we listen to it and expect to hear from God, if you're not a believer, you will be saved. If you are a believer, you'll be grown up. And if you are a believer, your worship and love for God will be expanded and increased and joy will result and you will be satisfied. May we be people who love to hear the word of God proclaimed. May we be people who are always coming under the word of God. May I be a preacher who's always under the word. May everybody who follows me in this pulpit be under the word. And may all of us grow into increasing joy and satisfaction in God. And that will glorify God. Let's pray. Father, uh, grateful, so grateful that you have spoken to us and we need to hear from you all the time. And I'm so grateful that you use flawed humans to do this because we wouldn't hear from you at all through a man. We had to wait for a perfect one. Father, make us all people who delight to hear from you in whatever context that is. Make us people who respond to you in faith. Make us people, Father, who are truly worshiping you in spirit and in truth. May Jesus, your Son, Father, be glorified in our individual lives and in this church. And it's in his name we ask these things. Amen.